Hey, I'm Chris, and with me is Rob, and today we're taking a deep dive into episode 6. Okay, yeah, we finally got to see Paul's point of view in the Red Universe, and I think it played out pretty much how we thought it would. And now that we have Paul's perspective to fill in a few of the gaps, Chris, where does that leave us now and going forward in the show? So in order to explain it, I'm going to start at the cause of the event, which is the cow turning on. The reason this is important is because the cow's function was to create a condensate, a Bose-Einstein condensate, which in simple terms means the rubidium particles that were inside the cow when it turned on get super cold and merge into one form of matter. They stop being separate particles, become one thing. Yeah, if you really want to see a deeper dive on that, Chris put together a great video. Check the top right-hand corner. It's important to remember that the cow is taking things that were separate and making them into one thing when we reference the cow later in the theory. So if we start off with episode six, we're seeing the first time we get the dead cosmonaut. The dead cosmonaut's coming in because she originated in the red universe, the non-cow universe, because we see Paul working on some other experiment. The dead cosmonaut comes in, the alarm goes off because triggers the, sensors, the alarm. Yeah. yeah, that's right. The sensors see it coming because it's coming from far away because it was in that universe. It hits the porthole that we see Joe die in. But that hole was not there before when Joe hit it. Joe made didn't cause con- the hole. When she made contact with the window, the hole was already the there. The hole was already there. That would cause Because that's why she was sucked yeah. towards it in the first place. That yes. caused a depress on the red ISS because the dead cosmonite hit it, cracked that mask, bounced under it, and then kept on going on its merry way. If you watch the, the zoom out of that ISS, the red ISS, you can see the cosmonaut kind of pop out from under the big sails. They look kind of like sails. If you follow the trajectory, you can tell it's coming from the area where that pot of the, the observatory window was, where the accident happened. Now that part stumped me because if you were to look at episode one, that's not where the damage was when we saw Joe pull the day cosmonaut out and send her on her way. Not only did we not see that is the impact point, it's also not the direction that the day cosmonaut was thrown out. So that threw me for a loop because I initially thought that we were just seeing a replay of episode one from a different perspective. Not what's happening. We saw the red ISS get hit, caused the face mat crack, caused the accident on the red ISS, caused Joe's death. Now, at this point, the dead cosmonaut's flying through space. She's moving pretty quick. And this is where the theory comes in. The cow's now turned on. As we discussed a little bit earlier, the point of the cow is to create this new form of matter, which takes random particles that are bouncing around like they are right now in your room listening to this and make them into one form of matter by, you know, whatever processes they do. You can watch that in their video, but it mushes them down into one form of matter. What I'm thinking happened is basically they turn the cow on. Either Irina phases into that universe or the ISS phases into that one, but it doesn't really matter. The point is Irina can now hit the blue ISS. And the sensors don't go off because when they turn it on, Irene is pretty much already right there. They're now sharing this space together and it whacks right into the ISS. There was no time for the sensors to go off. It just popped up into that universe. Irene is right there. If he didn't turn the cow on, if he had to go to the bathroom first, she probably would have rolled right on by him in the orbit. They would have turned on. The show doesn't exist. But that's not what happened. He turned it on. Boom. They share the same point in space. She rams into the ISS and mayhem ensues on the blue ISS. Since the cow is now activated, since it's merging things together, that's when we see the portals, I guess portals, these, these bright lights that, that activate all of a sudden. And blue Joe falls to her death and red Joe watches that from above mm-hmm. for a little bit. At that point, it answers also the question, at least for me and Rob, on why Alice is involved. See, before I first thought... This was a problem because being on FaceTime and seeing the cow turned on doesn't mean anything because everyone at uh, RPL also saw it on camera. But that's not what happens here. Yes, they did see it turn on, then the camera shut off, but the iPads go into the portals with the respective Joes. Joe that dies brings her iPad down in there, gets sucked in with her. The other Joe has it still stuck to her hand. And she gets pushed through the other one. So essentially the Alice's did go through and that's why it affected Alice on the iPad and not just anyone watching the camera footage back at mission control because Mm -hmm. the cameras were shut off anyway. 
And even if they were on, based on this theory, unless they had gone through, it probably still wouldn't have affected them. The camera that's hooked to the wall might have had to like break off and go through to cause that sure. or something. And that and that brings us to the current state of what was going on in episode one. So essentially, Dead Cosmonaut starts in the Red Universe, hits the Red ISS with no cal, bounces off. The blue one phases in because of the cal. It whacks right into that one, causes a problem. The cal merging things in causes these portals. The Pauls and the Joes flip through. The Alice's flip through with it. And then we're back where we were at the beginning of episode one, except just from Paul's perspective. But the same right. kind of rules apply. All right. So we know that was a lot of information. But if you do want more context, uh, like we said, refer, refer to the other video, um, drop comments. We have more context we can always add. But that being said, one of the other big takeaways that I think Chris and I both got from this episode was just how big of a part the liminal space was playing in this show. I think we had an idea that there were there was obviously some involvement there, but it's it's definitely more impactful than we were even thinking now that we've seen both sides of the context here in the story. Yeah, 100%. And after some new evidence and observations have come to light after researching for this video, Liminal Space is a good contender for how the button was pushed that released both capsules. Yeah, exactly. So for Liminal Space, especially in this show, Liminal Space is that area between the two realities that we know. So between red reality and blue reality. So purple reality. The, purple reality, yes. That is a good way to put it. And that is where we believe the button pusher or the person who released the capsules is. And that person in particular, I think there was a lot of theories going around from the jump anyways, that it looked similar to Joe, that it could be a Joe. I don't disagree with that. And I personally believe that that is because within this liminal space, there exists a, let's call it a combo version of red and blue Joe that exists within this liminal space. And that Joe is who pushed the button. I don't disagree with, with your assessment. I mean, we still don't know who pushed the button. And it, in my opinion, looks like a woman. Whether or not it's Joe, I don't know. But I agree with Rob 100% that being that we don't have any other evidence, the most likely candidate is Joe. And the liminal space argument makes sense. My question for you, Rob, is why don't we have a liminal Paul helping out up there as well as a liminal Joe? Boy, oh boy, I'm glad you asked me that, Chris. <laughs> because I think I, I think I realized that the reason we don't is because Paul's body is on the Soyuz with Joe, whereas live Paul is also in the Soyuz. So Joe being left on the ISS the way we saw Paul leave her body gave her her liminal being the ability to be on the ISS. Got it. And so there was no version of Paul up there to do that. And I, and I, I'm really clear. I don't think Rob's saying this is like zombie Joe, because in the screenshots and stuff, she's not, she doesn't have an eye patch. It's not the mm -hmm. dead Joe from the ISS. To it's not a, it's not a zombie Joe, which however, if there was one real brave guy, Paul here, putting his face so close Yo. to a potential space zombie. Actually though, to that point, I do think if we're looking at these liminal, this liminal entanglement, I think that that's a really good example of where we yeah. see that happening, where we have Joe and Paul on both realities stuck in this situation with the dead version of the other one, but seeing these signs of life, the breathing that they're hearing, this entanglement, yeah. the combination version of the two is what we're seeing there. And then the other point I would piece out that I, the other piece that I would point out that I think we've seen in the show, that's the perfect example is the pictures. And obviously we, we get a call out to them in the cabin as well yep. in this episode by Alice saying, this is the painting of the changeling where we talked about it early on. When we started talking about the show, we had the angel on the staves that were being held up. We had the changeling one that we've seen a close up on again now, but then we had the combination version of the changeling on the, the poles, the same way the angel was. So that would be my other example of what I'm talking about, where these two versions of the same person being entangled into one combination piece in that liminal space. 
So I think that, again, I think that that's the explanation for how they were released and, and who it was. The mysterious third option that is now no longer mysterious. Yeah, I I agree. Yeah, the paintings make sense. It's a good callback because the the merged painting is in the liminal cabin. It's the cabin with the dead cat and everything's kind of glitchy and, and phased out when she's walking up to it. I guess the purple cabin, we can call it this liminal space cabin. So the reason that we're going a little bit harder and we we're expanding the liminal space role is because we have some new evidence. And evidence one is that multiple versions of the ISS, there's the red ISS, there's the blue ISS, and then the purple ISS. And that is when Joe comes out of the wardrobe uh, scene where Alice is in the wardrobe. Mm -hmm. You see her kicking in episode six. And in mm -hmm. episode one, she's with the flashlight. When she comes out of that little mode and she flips back into the ISS, the middle image is what you're getting. You're getting this ISS that has none of the characteristics of the first two, red or blue. And we're assuming that this is liminal space and that this is liminal space Joe, and she's the button pusher. The reason that we think she's the button pusher is for another piece of evidence, because up to that point, liminal space in my head was a place that they could exist, but not affect red or blue. You're just right. a ghost looking at things, but you're not rattling any chains. You're not making physical contact with the other realities. Which led to the problem is if they can't affect them, how can she push the button that does affect them? But that problem was solved because when Joe's in the capsule trying to put in the deorbit calculations in episode one, she goes, I'm just going to put in the old ones. It doesn't really work. She bangs the crap out of the screen and it, and it just kind of works. I'm assuming that bang the crap out of the screen moment ties to when Paul banged the crap out of the screen. It was probably Agreed. around the same time. Yep. That kind of tracks. But the more interesting part is in the next scene, she's doing the math to calculate her deorbit parameters. She goes through it. She's with the pencil and she goes, finished. Great. She puts the clipboard up because Sergey's pre-recorded message tells her to go get the cow experiment. Don't risk your life. She goes right. and gets the cow, comes back. When she sits down, buckles the cow up like a baby, she goes, great. I'm going to pull my clipboard out, put my deorbit parameters in. At that point, we realize the papers are not the same. The bottom numbers do not match. There's nobody else up there and they're in the exact same handwriting. So that means another version of Joe either changed or more likely corrected the parameters that were on the paper. And to me, means that liminal Joe is able to affect one of the other two realities and therefore makes her being the button pusher that affected physically red and blue a plausible answer. Joe's handwriting is a good call because in my head, as you were explaining it, even though we've already talked about this offline a little bit, as you're explaining it, I thought, is there a chance her and Paul flipped phase, right? Maybe Paul changed something on the sheet that we didn't see, but in her handwriting is the perfect call out on that too, by the way. Paul never had this problem. He never lost connection with uh, Houston. They didn't have the same like major impact from the crash where like everything wasn't working anymore. Right. Um, it was just the, the air. It was just the depressed the and they the couldn't get out. And, you know, you can't stay up there forever. They was just the Band-Aid. He was able to talk to them. He got real parameters that they sent him and uploaded uh, and, and went on his way. Anyway, enough of Paul. And let's talk about the end of the episode when we see the cabins. We also believe the reason they're able to see each other at the cabin is we get very prominent scenes about crossing the ice to get to the cabin. Yep. both by Joe with Alice in the back seat and more so Alice leading Magnus crossing through there into the to get to these cabins they're getting to this liminal space or at least closer to that liminal space where they're able to see each other uh, Alice can see the versions of herself which would also be very freaky i also really appreciated this these scenes because we saw the dynamic of how similar Magnus and the other Alice are and then Joe and that Alice that's with Magnus, you see their personalities and their thought process and how they're almost the same on both sides. Yeah. So I thought that was really cool just from a TV making standpoint. And again, just to tie this back to another thing we called out in another episode, uh, five miles out being a liminal space, five miles out on the water. We've had this imagery of water being yeah. that liminal space conduit. So going over the lake, even though it was frozen, similar, similar idea. 
lastly, not to beat a liminal horse to death, but there's one more instance where we get kind of an odd possible liminal space moment is at the cemetery. When Alice and the crew go to Paul's grave to drop off their white roses and then Joe wants a personal moment, we see uh, in episode, I think it was episode two or three, one of the earlier episodes prior to knowing about the Red Universe, we see Paul pop up. Right? And what he's, what he's saying is, is a poem by Edith Sodergran. On foot, I had to cross the solar system. It's a Swedish Finnish poet, a metaphor about self-discovery, not being here nor there, loneliness and cosmic loneliness and all this kind of stuff from the Rock and Girl story in episode one about space being so lonely and self-discovery episodes where they're trying to figure out who they are and where they belong in the universe and, and all this kind of stuff. So more importantly, though, in the last episode, when we see that scene replayed, he doesn't say the poem. And he's way closer than he was in the first episode or the, mm -hmm. the episode earlier in the season when we saw that. It seems like there's just this purple version of things that are combining and, and talking and popping up every now and then. But I want you to go on and talk about the, uh, yeah. the next big thing we're going to talk about. Yeah, I think, we've, I think we've been kind of beating around the bush here a little bit, Chris, because we've gotten this far in the episode and we haven't talked about Chekhov's gun. Sorry, Bud's gun, because we really ended this episode with a bang. And wow, you're just dropping <laughs> jokes left and right. You just didn't learn and your lesson from the last episode. You just I you will just never learn my punishment. lesson. <laughs> Chris, did Bud shoot Paul? What do you think? Did, do you think he shot him? No, I don't think Bud shot Paul. I think that he shot a random as a warning shot. Yeah, I'm actually glad you phrased it that way because I do think, to your point, I don't think he shot him specifically for the reason that I believe this is going to be kind of the catalyst for another part of the show that we've seen. I think this is going to be a big influence on the relationship we've seen between Henry and Bud. My personal thought now is that Paul is going to essentially explain to Bud the Henry that he knows from his reality, this hero that he knows that won a Nobel prize that trained him how to be an astronaut and was such a stand-up guy. And the timelines haven't lined up perfectly as we've seen episode six and what we've seen so far in the rest of the show. It seems to me like we're lining up in a situation where Paul will tell him all this information, Bud will realize how great Henry's had it. And that's going to be the trigger for the animosity that we've seen where bud has been actively trying to essentially sabotage henry's life but this is what pushes him past knowing there might be something to active warfare yeah i don't disagree with that the revelation that this is real because someone else is going through it who's a credible guy like paul lancaster and what he already assumed kind of justifies his belief and then he goes on the offensive and we start to get uh, pee your pants, bud, and not just like walking by the mirror, bud. Yeah, I think I think the best way I summed it up for the whole timeline is, you know, bud finally just had it with trying to block out the fact, taking his pills, gets rid of his pills on the cruise ship like we talked about, uh, leads him to being in this now more vulnerable situation where he saw the entanglement, saw traces of it. Paul explains his situation, realizes he's in the same thing. He realizes Henry's experiment with the cow in the first place is what probably got them into this situation. I think we'll probably learn more about his trip and their trip to space on Apollo 18. That gets us to the point now where Henry and Bud are at odds, mostly yeah. due to Bud being angry. Well, I, I agree with you. And it's funny right now, I kind of thought about this. One of my bigger hangups was the cruise ship. And if I'm looking back in my head at the chain of events early in the episodes, Irina asked if she if Bud if Henry's talked to his brother and Henry says not in years thank God so it's not like an event that's happening all the time even yeah. there's this opening scene when they're walking down the hallway right when the incident happens you see Bud's face in like the in the mirror in the picture that walks by like the reflective picture but even that I think is maybe just one of the reasons Bud thinks he was going crazy. Because right. he was seeing things like that. Not that he was actively looking in on Henry. And then on the cruise ship, when he calls his daughter or whoever it might have been, she's like, hey, I'm busy. But if you, he's like, if you know, you're, it's mental, it's in your head. He goes, I'm not going crazy, yada, yada, yada. Like 
he's been struggling with this issue yes. for a little bit now. And he it kind of pushes him over the edge a little bit when the book that he wrote doesn't reflect reality. The, the, the name of your dog is wrong. Like basic stuff in the book doesn't reflect his life. He thinks he's going nuts and he chucks the pills overboard. And I think at that point is after that is when we get the Paul and Bud meeting and to your point justifies what he's saying. And then he's like, I'm going on the offensive hell with Henry Caldera because Bud was the one that did it correctly. Henry screwed up. That's not to say Henry was a screw up because I don't think that he went to the other universe and just got smart, but he didn't do the heroic thing when he had the chance because they flipped Bud's been self-medicating with alcohol and pills for 50 years and has become just a fan. And Henry is the one who got all the credit. And Henry's living that life and he's, you know, he's, he's doing that thing. And, and now Bud's pissed off about it. And I think somewhere along the line now, that's how we're going to get Paul and Joe to eventually like understand what's, what's going on. I think Henry is going to approach Joe and, just like in the mirror universe, Paul is approaching Bud and it's going to come to some sort of situation. I think sure. everyone kind of knows about this. Hence the conspiracy part of the tag along. I think people know about what's happening in both universes. Sure. That are trying to cover it up. Yes. Because in both universes, they use the same phrase. We don't talk about this, but it does happen. Right. As if like, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, like they know. And if they say, if we find Paul, he's going to have to go away. Not for a little bit, not get treated, not get worked on. He's going to have to go away, which was a really ominous way to tell someone's wife that you're going to help out their husband with a possible like, you know, mental uh, issue, PTSD coming back from space. He's going to have to go away. It's kind of on the shady side, at least for me. Well, while they may be looking for Paul so that he might go away, Chris, I think it's time for us to go away. But before we go, if you like what we're doing and you enjoy the video and you learn anything, do us a favor, hit the like button. If you really like the video, hit the subscribe button and let the algorithm know that we're doing the right track and doing a good job. We appreciate everyone listening and we hope you'll join us next week for episode seven into the looking glass. 